Welcome to the Aerospace Advantage podcast. I'm your host, John Slickbaum. Here on the Aerospace Advantage, we have the opportunity to speak with leaders in the DoD, industry, and other subject matter experts to explore the intersection of strategy, operational concepts, technology, and policy when it comes to air and space power. So if you like learning about aerospace power, you are in the right place. Now to our regular listeners, welcome back. And if it's your first time here, thank you so much for joining us. Now, as a reminder, if you like what you're hearing today, do us a favor and follow our show. Please give us a like and leave a comment so we can keep charting the trajectories that matter to you most. Okay, anyone paying attention to the recent news stories about what's occurring in Ukraine can't miss the incredible effectiveness of UAVs or unmanned aerial vehicles. Despite the pretty daunting David and Goliath type dynamics, the Ukrainian UAVs have been incredibly active surveilling Russian forces and launching extremely accurate and lethal strikes against a wide variety of aim points, everything from tanks and armored vehicles to leadership targets and supply depots. And in many cases, this isn't new. U.S. forces executed these sorts of strikes on a daily basis for the past two decades in Afghanistan and Iraq, and it all came down to taking advantage of a sensor-shooter construct. UAVs, thanks to their long-dwell capabilities and powerful sensors, can really gain tremendous situational awareness about a specific area and seek out important targets to strike with onboard munitions, and because they're not working against the clock with tight margins, they can wait for the right time to act. And that really means better chances of avoiding unnecessary civilian casualties and circumstances that really maximize gaining the desired outcome. And it's also about waiting for the right time and place. So once that's in play, then the missile is launched and the UAV can provide immediate post-strike imagery to assess whether a reattack is needed or if the objective was secured. So taking that into consideration and the fact that the U.S. is the global leader in UAV innovation and production, you'd expect the Ukrainians to be operating U.S.-built systems, right? Well, you'd be mistaken. Their aircraft are actually made in Turkey. And this isn't a one-off situation. It turns out that the Department of State policy, which extended across numerous administrations, is actually blocking many of our friends and allies from buying our UAVs. These countries need equipment, so they'll turn to countries like China, Russia, and Turkey, even Iran, for alternatives. So while the State Department may be holding out for an idealistic vision of arms control when it comes to UAVs, real-world dynamics are making that position irrelevant. In fact, it's actually hurting U.S. interests in a lot of fronts. Okay, so we've been tracking this issue for a long time, and Heather Penny just released a report on this this week. So with that, I'd like to welcome her to learn more about why we seem to be shooting ourselves in the foot on what should be a pretty clear-cut issue. So Heather, thanks so much for making time to be here today. (laughs) Slick, good to be back. Thanks so much. Okay, Heather, in the uh, intro, I tried to explain the 100,000-foot version of what's going on right now and the major factors, but you are the expert, so can you flesh out the details further for us? Absolutely, Slick. So first, let me just lay out who the different players are, right? You've got our allies and our partners who have seen how effective these unmanned aircraft are, and they they want them for their own capabilities. Um, We've got the State Department and the foreign relations community, whether or not that's in the Hill or just in that whole defense ecosystem, that are seeking to block these sales. Um, So you've got split oversight between the State Department and the military in terms of deciding who actually gets to to import these capabilities. And, you know, the military, for their part, they're looking to seek to export these capabilities largely because they understand the value of having strong partners, strong allies, and the value that sharing the same equipment brings when you can integrate and operate together. So they're looking at it from a coalition force perspective. So it's interesting, you've got you know, the military that really wants to be able to export these unmanned aircraft. You've got the foreign relations and diplomatic community that's trying to prevent these export of aircraft. And then you have to ask yourself why. I already explained the value that the military sees there, but why would the State Department and the foreign relations community, the diplomatic community, want to to really hold these capabilities back, right? I mean, you would think the military would be the one that would want to hold back the best stuff and be the most secretive and, you know, only we get to play with our toys. But it's because the State Department, the diplomatic community, they're concerned about proliferation. 
they're really concerned that if you let the genie out of the bottle, that suddenly everyone's going to have remotely piloted aircraft, unmanned area vehicles, unmanned aircraft, that this is just going to just cover the globe and they're going to do bad things with it. Well, I'll tell you what, it's already happened. <laughs> I mean, it, it, and you can just see what's going on, um, you know, in Ukraine right now with the with their TB2s. And, and, it, and even though Russia is not getting a lot of play with their remotely piloted aircraft, they are also operating UAVs. I mean, everybody has these. And guess what? China is flooding the market with this as well. So um, although you can see that there's good intent there with what the State Department's trying to do by not allowing the exports of these aircraft, uh, really, all they're doing is they're creating a market vacuum that China is filling. Sure. Now, Heather, uh, I know there's some long-running policy that ties into a, a lot of this, uh, I'll call it culture, right? And uh, I mentioned it up front that the missile technology control regime, and most people call that the MTCR, uh, that that really ties into it. So how does that impact things? I'm glad you brought that up. So I'd mentioned the non-proliferation piece of this, right? Um, that the State Department's really committed to. And this plays into that culture of them trying to tamp down on the proliferation. It's not just proliferation of technology, per se. It's the proliferation specifically of nuclear weapons and WMD, chem and bio. So the Missile Technology Control Regime, the MTCR, was actually um, brought together in the late 1980s because the international community figured if nuclear weapons and WMD is a bad thing, we want to prevent the spread of that. And another thing that we can do to prevent the spread of those weapons is prevent the spread of the, the delivery technology, the vehicles. And so that's what the missile technology control regime, and it says it in its name, right, missile. They were really focused on ballistic missiles, SCUDs, and ICBMs. Well, in the 1990s, the MTCR plenary looked around and said, you know those drones? They look a lot like cruise missiles. So we're going to treat drones like they're cruise missiles. And they rolled up unmanned aircraft into the MTCR, and things haven't changed. So still today, you've got the diplomatic community, when they're making export decisions, treating remotely piloted aircraft, unmanned aircraft, and likely, if things don't change, future autonomous teaming aircraft like their cruise missiles. And that's just not the case. I think this is one of the big thrusts of our, of our study is that we're trying to provide clarity within this community about what's a weapon and what's an unmanned aircraft. A weapon is one way. So like, for example, a lot of folks have, have looked at Ukraine and had the administration said, we're, 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 we're exporting 100 switchblade UAVs. Those are not UAVs. Switchblades are munitions. Sure, they've got little wings that pop out and they can fly far and they've got a little video and there's some control to the operator. But once you pop out a switchblade, that's a one-way mission. That thing is not coming back. It's going to go out there and it's going to explode. Um, an aircraft is a vehicle that you plan to recover. It might take off on a rocket, might take off on a runway, might come back on a parachute, might land on its own gear but you're still planning to recover that and reuse it. And I think that's the important distinction um, that we need to make between what's a munition and what's an aircraft. Now, an aircraft may employ munitions, but it itself is not a missile. Yeah, I appreciate that clarity. And I just want to ask as well that didn't part of the language interpretation get updated a few years ago? Uh, and I thought that was supposed to fix part of this. You know, it didn't. So uh, through 2017 to 2020, the Trump administration tried to modify the MTCR. So the way that the MTCR looks at um, these any delivery vehicle, it puts them into two classifications. The first classification, um, and, and they're, both of them are based off of range and payload. Uh, category 1, those bigger systems, uh, are defined as those that can go more than 300 kilometers and carry more than 300 kilograms of payload. This is all based off of scuds, right? So the, the sense was that if it was bigger, could go further, carry more, um, it was more dangerous. And then your Category 2 systems is basically everything that falls beneath that. What the Trump administration tried to do was uh, bring in an additional airspeed requirement, so 800 kilometers per hour. And the MTCR uh, uh, plenary, the membership, did not reach consensus, and so that language did not get changed. But internally, the administration, the administration said, this is how we will interpret those guidelines. So internal to the United States, they, they added that uh, definition into how they would interpret these categories. Now, this is important to remember. The MTCR is not 
not legally binding. It is, it is not a treaty. It is actually an informal political agreement. It's an understanding. So there's nothing that actually requires us to abide by it. It's something that, that we want to abide by as a nation that supports nonproliferation efforts. So we can still export things. Uh, underneath the MTCR, what we need to do is be able to um, justify that in, to ourselves in order to be able to overcome that strong presumption of denial. So the language did get interpreted internally. It did not actually change at the MTCR level amongst the membership, but that's, that's what happened internally. Okay, so just really cutting to brass tacks here, uh, what what are the allied and partner demand signals like these days? And you know how active are the requests for our UAVs right now? So the allied and partner demand signal is skyrocketing. Um, but the request for our American-built uh, UAVs is not. And that's because we've seen, you know, we've, we've basically created a track record where our allies and partners know that if they come and they ask the State Department, um, they say, hey, we're interested in your remotely piloted aircraft or other UAVs, they're going to get told no. So why even bother asking when they know the answer is no from the get-go? Okay, so Heather, what do these countries do when the U.S. declines their request for UAVs? <laughs> it's simple. Either they figure out how to build it themselves um, or they turn to China, right? I mean, China is, wow. yeah, China is really exploiting this as a market vacuum as a way to, um, to do all the things that we know that foreign military sales do for, for a nation, right? They're going to expand their influence through the export of their UAVs. They're going to strengthen their bilateral relationships. They're going to create um, those dependencies that come from from exporting uh, their, their military capabilities. And the, the other thing, too, that's really interesting that, that foreign military sales provides that I don't think is widely recognized by the public is how that then impacts the technological base at home. When you do foreign military sales, not only do you get all the goodness that I talked about, uh, including as well as, as developing those interpersonal relationships that result from training and operating together and the interoperability and the integration that you get by sharing the same capabilities. I mean, it's, it's, that's an, the entire reason why we did the F-16 and the F-35 and, and so forth. But, but what happens is, is the monies that come from those other countries buying our military technologies goes back to the defense industrial base. And they then, that strengthens them, provides resilience when, when we're not buying a lot of stuff, they're keeping production lines open, they're keeping engineers employed, and they're also then investing in the next advanced technology. So that's exactly what China is doing right now. Not only are they getting that global influence, not only are they creating relationships, um, not only are they expanding their presence around the globe, but they're also getting that influx of cash that is strengthening their defense industrial base and, and then also pushing their technology forward. So we're seeing China rapidly advance their capabilities, rapidly advance their designs, and this dynamic is not slowing down. Okay. I'm sorry, Heather. I'm gonna, I was going to interrupt you here for a second, but I, I just got to circle back on something. Cause you mentioned you know, countries are buying top-end manned combat aircraft from us, but at the same time, they're denied access to, you know, propeller-driven UAVs. So what's up with that? <laughs> yeah, I know. It's crazy, right? We're willing to sell a country uh, an F-15 or an F-35, but we're not willing to sell them, um, you know, a propeller-driven remotely piloted aircraft. It, yeah, I mean, it just it does not pass the common sense test. And again, it gets all back to this MTCR problem, which, you know, basically tells the State Department, start with no, and it really takes a lot of work to overcome that barrier to get to yes. Uh, and the other piece of it, too, is this misconception about about what RPAs are, what rem remotely piloted aircraft are, how they're used, and what their effects are on the battle space. I, I think that too many people think of these Reapers and, and Predators and Global Hawks um, as this, these dystopian robots um, that perpetuate human rights abuses and, and so forth. And, you know, fortunately, that's just not true. 
Yeah, and one one thing I do want to, and I appreciate the clarification there, but I want to jump to another important clarification here because we've been using the acronym, you know, UAV a lot uh, in our discussion, which stands for unmanned aerial vehicle. Uh, but is there anything unmanned about what we're making these days? I mean, are these aircraft, you know, really these autonomous killer bots like we see in the movies? <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, they're anything but unmanned. I mean, just because you don't have a human in the aircraft doesn't mean that's unmanned, right? Which is why you're seeing the language that the Air Force used really move towards remotely piloted aircraft. Because these are airplanes. They are aircraft. And if you look at how we operate them, their pilot is still there operating all the physical go up, go down, turn right, turn left. Um, He just doesn't happen to be in the airplane. So the crew, if you if you look at, for example, let's say uh, take an MQ-9, so a Reaper station, you have the pilot sitting there physically flying the airplane, literally making it go where he wants it to go, and then the sensor operator is sitting next to the pilot, physically managing all of the sensors um, and the weapons. So they're doing that together. And, oh, by the way, they're not doing that by themselves. They have an entire intelligence team behind them that is doing real-time analysis of all of those sensor feeds. And they can stop, they can pause, they can rewind, they can zoom in, they can zoom out. So it's just additional eyeballs and additional humans that are there doing that analysis of the intelligence that's being gathered by the remotely piloted aircraft. And so you have a number of different layers of of human decision-making, human analysis that's going into this all at 1G and zero knots, which, I mean, you know, Slick, because you flew jets as well. I mean, if you're zipping around the sky, that that decreases your, your computational power for actually doing a lot of the interpretation of the sensors that you're getting. So when you when you do that, at, like I said, at, at 1G and zero knots, and then you're adding multiple people on top of that, they're collaborating, they're comparing, they're, they're talking with each other. It really increases the quality of the decision making. And, oh, by the way, if you get to the point where you're recognizing something that's out of the norm, when you realize that you're hitting a a potential window where you could prosecute an attack because the collateral damage is low, who gets involved? Higher headquarters. So you have commanders, their joint staff, as well as their entire legal counsel coming together to make a decision. Does this fit, you know, what our intent is, the commander's intent and and orders uh, for this particular target set? What's the collateral damage look like? Uh, How long do we have this window? Do we need to notify additional individuals? So there's nothing unmanned about how we operate these airplanes. And what we've actually found is that uh, in many cases, remotely piloted aircraft may be uh, the the weapon system of choice, even as opposed to manned aircraft, because as as I mentioned, um, you know, manned aircraft, whether fighters or or bombers, may have a, a less time on station. So they there may be a sense of urgency to press an attack when it might not necessarily be the optimum conditions for that. Whereas remotely piloted aircraft, because they do have that loiter time. Uh, because they are able to maintain that custody um, of the of the target, that positive ID, they can bide their time and wait until the conditions are ideal, and they can minimize collateral damage and really make a precise and surgical type of strike. Yeah, absolutely. And and I will say, you know, not being a devil's advocate, but I'm absolutely a fan of, you know, centralized control, decentralized execution and, and, and hate when you've got to go through the lawyers in order to hit the pickle button. I think, you know, American airmen are, are trained to be able to execute targets. But I do see the value uh, in, you know, specific uh, arenas where that does make a lot of sense. So, you know, it's like I'm really glad you brought that up because um, because we don't always have to go and ask Mother May I to the generals that are back in the AOC. Right. It really depends on the target set. So that's why I say sometimes it goes up there. It depends on the target set, sort of the especially because some of the individuals that we've been um, uh, targeting, that's what will potentially trigger going up. But what we've done over time is we've we've have such highly trained airmen. Uh, who understand the rules of engagement, that they understand what they're doing, that, that oftentimes, depending on the target set, that, will, that authority will be delegated down. But, you know, again, it, it depends. But that's a good thing is that, that we're able to take the time to understand what we're doing and when we need to either float that up or where we can maintain that decision down to the lower level. Absolutely. You know, and one thing, and I know we kind of touched on, uh, 
how the State Department is kind of spring loaded to say no, but uh, you know, really getting to the heart of the matter and probably why they are so spring loaded to say no is, you know, I've got to ask you, what happens if we sell uh, a nation a UAV or any other piece of military equipment and they turn out to be the bad actor? Uh, let's play out the State Department's worst case scenario here. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Because you know, just because you're a partner, a security partner, we have partners across the globe that are not exactly the same as us, right? I mean, you take a look at the Middle East um, as a particular example, or as we're looking to expand and strengthen our relationships and our partnerships um, in, in the Pacific as well. These are different kinds of states, uh, and they don't always hold the same values that we have. I will say that the foreign military sales process, um, because it does strengthen our relationship, it does strengthen those bilateral um, uh, those those bilateral ties, and also it allows us to engage at the person-to-person -person level, so that interpersonal level where we're doing the training, we're, we're showing them our tactics, techniques, and procedures, and the best way to use this. Oftentimes, that engagement allows us to shape how they plan to employ those weapon systems. So that's kind of the first step, right? Also, part of, of any kind of foreign military sales is that end-use agreement, where we can put caveats and limitations, uh, and that's, again, to make sure that when we are exporting our systems, we're also exporting some of our values about, um, you know, legal force application and human rights and so forth. So that's part of it as well. Uh, and that should also be something that shapes how they employ those systems. Now, I will say some states prefer to not do business with us because they want total sovereign choice on how they employ uh, uh, their weapons, and that's that's their decision. But if we don't engage, we don't get the opportunity to shape that. And we don't get the opportunity not only to shape the immediate employment decision, but the long-term shaping of how that state then thinks about their military capabilities. But not everything's perfect, right? I mean, think about when we exported F-4s and F-14s to Iran, uh, and then the Shah fell. Uh, so what do we do then? Well, it, it actually turns out to be fairly simple in that if you if you don't supply those weapon systems with spare parts and um, you know all the things that we need to do to sustain them, they actually lose their ability to employ them fairly rapidly. Just think about how hard it is for us to maintain the readiness of our own systems when we deploy. So um, if it's contract maintenance, that's much easier for us to be able to turn off. Uh, but we can also turn off the supplies and the spares uh, and, and other elements of the logistical and maintenance chain as well. So, and we've seen that here just in our own personal lives, right? As soon as the supply chains uh, start going down, um, we've seen that in our own personal consumption, whether or not you're looking to buy a new car or a new computer or so forth. So, um, so this actually turns out to be a fairly effective enforcement mechanism. Yeah, and I absolutely uh, appreciate that and, and agree. I mean, uh it's just like trying to get my, my iPhone going after a couple of years. <laughs> it's not going to work out so well. But, uh, you know, Heather, I've got to ask you about the future here. Um, you know, the Air Force and other services, you know, they're talking a lot about autonomous man on man teaming. So given those vectors, is the State Department, uh, you know, being smart to try to keep uh, controls on this technology? I'm glad you brought that up because this was actually one of the forcing functions of why we, we delved back into this issue. Because we looked at the MTCR um, a couple of years ago, specifically because of remotely piloted aircraft and how they were being impacted and how that was impacting our ability to to shape and engage our partners around the globe. But as we're now looking at man-to-man -man teaming and autonomy growing as part of what we'll do for the future, we really need to come to terms with, with how um, uh, the policies at State Department are restricting our abilities to, to export and share these technologies with our partners and allies. So remotely piloted aircraft are aircraft. We should treat them as aircraft as we go through the foreign military sales process and evaluation of, is this in our national interest? My concern is that autonomous aircraft or man-to-man -man teaming, that they'll just get swept into the same categories under the MTCR, and we won't share these capabilities with our partners. Now, we know as we go into the future against peer, you know, against peer adversaries, the tyranny of distance within the Pacific, and now we're looking at, um, you know, challenges within Europe and then also needing to maintain that presence within, within the Pacific, we simply don't have a manned force that is large enough to do both. We will have to augment that with autonomous unmanned aircraft. So if we are unwilling to share these technologies with our partners, 
then we are weakening our coalition force as a whole because they also need that kind of capacity. And if we develop operational concepts that rely on these autonomous aircraft, but we're not willing to share them with our partners, that really begins to break down the value of that integration, the value of that coalition, the value of that interoperability. And, oh, by the way, it creates the same market forces and market vacuums that China is exploiting today. We already know that China has an advantage in machine learning and an advantage in autonomy because of all the data that they have access to. So they already have that advantage. What happens now when they begin to insert autonomy, insert machine learning into their unmanned aircraft and begin to export that. Now suddenly they're collecting even more data. They're getting more information, not just the raw data from the sensors, but they're getting more information on how these aircraft operate, uh, what their tactics are, how to best employ them. And that's an advantage that we would then be forfeiting by choice. We'd be forfeiting that advantage by choice because we're just we're treating these aircraft like they're still ICBMs. It just makes no sense. Yeah, I, I think China's real advantage is they don't have the requirement system that we have. So <laughs> I think that's exactly the, <laughs> they don't have to deal with Jason. <laughs> yeah, but at, at any rate, uh, I know we, we just talked about the Far Rocks, and I really want to bring it in a little closer and, and get your opinion on you know what you think is next. I mean, this issue has been lingering for a long time. Uh, do you think anything's going to change in the near term? <laughs> well, I don't know, but I certainly hope so. I mean, just take a look at Ukraine. Uh, their TB2 uh, bioctars have been just doing great stuff. They have really allowed this David versus Goliath um, scenario. They've allowed Ukraine to really pinpoint target Russian forces and cue other weapons and even employ their own weapons against it. But it's really frustrating because you take a look at how effective those TB2s are. These TB2s are, first of all, they're Turkish, right? So thank goodness somebody exported unmanned aerial vehicles uh, to Ukraine to allow them to have this kind of capability. But they are these smaller aircraft. So just think about how much more effective they could have been if they'd been flying uh, a larger Category 1 U.S. remotely piloted aircraft. It's just, it's so frustrating because you just see what could have been. But then also think about the counterfactual, right? What if Ukraine did not have these? And this is really an important point um, that I would hope that State Department and foreign uh, policy folks would consider is look at the counterfactual. Look at an alternate fictional history where Ukraine did not have access to unmanned aircraft. I think we can easily see that Russia would have been more likely to steamroll right into the heart of Ukraine because the TB2 has been so effective at ISR about helping uh, Ukrainian military map out uh, what Russians were doing, or where, where their lines of attack were, and really uh, implementing the kill chain, being able to help them rapidly close those kill chains. And without unmanned aircraft, Ukraine would not have been able to do that. So... Any weapon can be used for any purpose, offensive or defensive. But we need to understand that these aircraft are here. Holding it back is not stopping proliferation. It's really important that we support our allies and partners with these aircraft because, again, we can't be everywhere at once. We know that our force size is too small, and so we have to strengthen our partners and allies to be that blunting force, that deterring force, so that we can swing where we need to and we can be the goalies, right? Because that, that's what Ukraine is doing for us today. They are the blunting force to prevent this from spilling into Europe and spilling into NATO. And that's, that, that's freeing us to be goalies there within Europe, but also making sure that we don't lose our presence within the Pacific. Well, Heather, I can't say thanks enough for, for you being here and really diving into uh, these topics with us. So um, really appreciate it and uh, looking forward to having you on the next show. Very good. Thanks so much. And, you know, one last closing comment is that, uh, again, we really support nonproliferation, but we need to make sure that we're not living in an ivory tower and making these decisions based on off of how we wish the world would be. So, you know, if you talk to some folks within the State Department, there's this wishful thinking that if we restrain ourselves, that our adversaries will too. And that's just simply not the case. When we restrain ourselves, they're going to step in and take that space. And that's an advantage that I think we all realize we cannot afford to give anymore. Yeah, I know that's a great point, Heather. And thanks for sharing that with us. All right. Thanks again. Looking, looking forward to the next time. With that, I'd like to extend a big thank you to our guests for joining in today's discussion. 
I'd also like to extend a big thank you to our listeners for your continued support and for tuning in to today's show. If you like what you've heard today, don't forget to hit that like button and follow or subscribe to the Aerospace Advantage. You can also leave a comment to let us know what you think about our show or areas you think we should explore further. As always, you can join in on the conversation by following the Mitchell Institute on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or LinkedIn, and you can always find us at mitchellaerospacepower.org. Thanks again for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Stay safe and check six.